So the first thing I noticed on your homepage read anti-fragile design to habit a fragile planet. Mm -hmm. And to me it sounds intriguing to say the least. Uh, would you please open that for us a little bit? Yes. The idea of anti-fragile came from Nassim Talib, who is a investment uh, counselor and stockbroker and uh, hedge fund manager. His idea was how can you have investments uh, which are plans for the future? How can you have them be able to not merely survive difficult changes, um, sudden market cra crashes or product surpluses or unforeseen events like hurricanes? How can you have something that would actually improve if the situation that it was in turned much worse? So that's what he called anti-fragile. And it's different than a word like robust. Robust is it stands up and it still stands even after the hurricane, even after the event, it's still there. That's robust. And it's not the same as um, strong or um, healthy or rich. It's a different word. It's a word that means the opposite of fragile. It gets stronger if it's in uh, bad conditions. Okay, so how can we make eco-villages anti-fragile? How can we make cities anti-fragile? How can we make uh, human progress anti-fragile? If you look at the cycles of nature, there are many clues in natural succession, how forests evolve, how uh, gardens evolve, how uh, insects uh, come in and uh, maybe clear an area, but then immediately something else emerges in that area that the insects have cleared. So something benefits from every disaster. Something is um, going, taking advantage of those things. What you need to do is to think in terms of design. How can we um, build in the expectation that the worst may happen, but it will be good for us? This is important because right now we're at a stage of human evolution where we have polluted our atmosphere. The planet is now in a situation where it's quickly getting too hot for humans. If you go to the, um, you know, any mammal has sweat glands and uh, the sweat is what cools the body. Uh, and if you get above um, 34 degrees, your sweat doesn't work very well. Uh, so you can't be outdoors above 34 degrees for extended periods of time. You have to get into the shade. You have to get into cooler places or you will overheat. Globally, as an average, with the temperature of the oceans, the temperature of the land masses, the temperature of the air, that translates to about a seven degree increase from the current average. So right now we're looking at a two degree increase by 2040 or so. We're going to hit 1.5 either maybe this year, 1.5 maybe next year, or, but this year possibly. Uh, but then we're going to hit two degrees, with, be sometime between 2030, 2040, we're going to hit two degrees. At, at the current trajectory, the best we could hope for would be 3.6 degrees increase by the end of the century, but it's possible we could hit 5 degrees by the end of the century. By the middle of the next century or the early years of the next century, we could well hit 7 degrees. At 7 degrees, our sweat glands will do us no good, which means we either have to live indoors with air conditioning and never go outdoors, uh, or we have to evolve into something more like a reptile and less like a mammal. Uh, I don't think either of those is a very enticing future. It's not a very happy prospect. Instead, what I'm more interested in is how can we develop and design our habitat so that it doesn't put carbon into the atmosphere and doesn't increase the temperature and in fact does just the opposite. It makes everything cooler. Uh, so how can we design our businesses, our travel, our ways we get our food, the ways we get our energy? All of those should be taking carbon from the atmosphere and cooling the planet. Right now for the next 100 years, 200 years, that's what all we should be doing. And to do that, you would, you would redesign 
the human civilization. You'd have to completely redesign it. But you wouldn't do it just as a sense of robustness. You would do it anti-fragile so that what's already happening, hurricanes, super typhoons, firestorms in, uh, the, at the edges of cities like Los Angeles, you're, you're building in a way that's going to not just survive that, but thrive during that so that you're around to take more carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay. Um, but um, I dare to say that we know that the problem with, with climate change, it's a social problem mm -hmm. as well. Uh, why don't we as nations and people still have the solution? Mm -hmm. The, it, you, it's exactly the problem that it's a social problem that, make, that prevents us from finding the solution. If it were merely a technological problem, Elon Musk or Bill Gates would have already solved it. There would be already an incentive to uh, have national laboratories making technical fixes. And in fact, they're trying. They're making uh, artificial trees, uh, the direct air capture machines that are taking carbon from the atmosphere. But why make artificial trees? The natural forests are much more efficient. They've been doing it a lot longer. They're better at it. Uh, they can make artificial whales by fertilizing the oceans with iron filings to make a greater bloom of plankton, which creates a, a carbon sink from, from the atmosphere to the ocean. Uh, but why do that when you have real whales that probably could use the help? Uh, real whales uh, bring nutrients from below and they bring it to the surface and they poop it out. And that poop makes uh, plankton, which draws carbon from the atmosphere. We don't need artificial whales. We need real whales. We don't need artificial trees. We need real trees. Uh, lots more. And we've done it wrong. We've just been uh, thinking that none of that mattered, that we can go ahead and kill the whales. It didn't matter that we cut down the trees. Well, it mattered. So we need to change all of that doing it. Well, that's a social problem. That's not a technological problem. How can we prevent people from hunting whales? How can we prevent people from uh, cutting down trees? You can look at that from a regulatory lens where you're a government and you want to uh, make it a crime to do these things or you want to tax people if they do those things. And that's one way to do it, but it's a stick approach. It's forcing people to do it. Whenever you do that, you people resist. They rebel. They push back. It's a kind of a principle of Aikido or Taekwondo where uh, resistance creates harder walls. Instead, you need to use the principle of Aikido or Taekwondo where you yield to the oncoming force and gently move it in one direction or another to suit your needs. The way we do that is by providing incentives, profit motives, or benefits from change. This is why eco-villages are such an important feature, which is a, a, a carrot, not a stick. Uh, showing what can be better, what could be a good life, what could be a, a nice way to live that actually does reduce carbon in the atmosphere and does improve um, uh, the, the stands of forest and the life of the whale. Your intro on the same previously mentioned page also opens several tools you use to help to create a cleaner planet. Mm. Um, will you please open some of your thoughts about sustainability and achieving it and what sustainability is in your opinion? I avoid the word sustainability. Uh, I try, you know, I call it the S word. I try to, I, I've, I've taken it, I, as much as possible, I re, I've tried to remove it from my personal vocabulary. And the reason is because it's based on assumptions. You have to ask yourself, um, what are we trying to sustain? Uh, is the assumption being that the civilization that has evolved for the last 8,000 years is sustainable? Is it possible that our mechanism of personal transport that involves private automobiles on concrete highways is sustainable? Is it possible that we could um, uh, live with the overkill of fish in the oceans on an indefinite basis? Of course not. Of course, none of those things are sustainable. So what do we mean when we say sustainable? What are we trying to sustain? There's an interesting piece of mathematics 
uh, that comes from looking at the climate science. There, uh, the scientists at the uh, IPCC, the International Panel on um, Climate Change, are looking at uh, what is the rate at which we have to decline our emissions from carbon into the atmosphere. And what they recognize is, is it's not enough to just bring emissions down. Emissions have to go below zero. They have to actually take carbon out of the atmosphere. So we need to go from emitting about 37 gigatons per year to taking 40 gigatons out every year. Okay, so looking at the slope, the, the shape of the curve that they have drawn that's required for us to get to a reasonable temperature this century, it's about an 11% decline slope. Well, the growth of fossil fuels, for example, over the last 150 years was about a 2% increase per year. Now we're talking about a carbon diminishment of 11% per year. If you relate that to energy, it means using less energy every year, 11% less than the year before. That's a doubling time of about uh, seven years, meaning that it's, it's half as much carbon in the atmosphere seven years from now as now. Think about that. Let's say we started that in 2020. By 2027, there would have to be half as many cars on the road, half as many airplane flights, half as many ships carrying goods from China to the U.S., half as many of air conditioners, half as many of uh, expensive new houses. With a growing population, how can you possibly achieve those rates? And yet, by 2027, we would have to have half, and, by, and seven years later, in 2034, we'd have to have half again. And seven years later, in 2041, we'd have to have half again. So we'd have to go half, and then half, and then half, and then half, and we have to do that for the rest of the century. Can you imagine? How do people live, live like that? And what does that mean in terms of the sustainable development goals of the UN where everyone should have enough food and everyone should have energy like North America and Europe right now? Uh, how can you possibly provide that while you have to reduce emissions by half? It's an enormous challenge. We need to leave, learn to live completely differently than we do now. We need to have bicycle transportation. We need to have uh, ways of getting our houses heated that are passive and involve the sun. We need to have ways of um, moving shorter distances between the food and the table. Uh, all of these things are going to radically alter in, in your lifetime and in the lifetime of your children. And it's going to be just a completely different society for them as it is for you. And your, your society is going to be completely different than the society that I grew up in. Uh, these changes have never happened that fast in human history before. They are now absolutely essential. They, we cannot survive unless we do them. Sooner or later, we're going to learn that we cannot survive unless we do them. It, we may have to get hit on the head with super hurricanes a while, but eventually we'll figure that out. And when we do, people are going to look for solutions. They're going to look for graceful, prosperous ways down. I think that's another reason for eco-villages, is to demonstrate a prosperous way down. What is the eco-village and permacultural response to climate change? Permaculture provides a series of design um, guidelines. It's a methodology. It's not any particular answer. It's examining and observing how nature works and saying, okay, well, if, if nature has a problem of overheating, it cools itself in this way. Uh, so you create cultivated ecologies. You build water into a landscape, and the evaporation of the water off of a pond or a river begins to cool the surroundings, and then you have more trees, and the trees provide more water, and there's more water in the river, and there's more evaporation. So permaculture is looking how nature solves the problem, and then applying that to human uh, situations humans become part of a larger ecology rather than something that's constantly battling against the larger ecology. Permaculture is an observation of existing patterns 
and then going with the flow of those patterns, going in the direction of those patterns, but maybe slightly ad adjusting them so that they favor our, our own survival. And then you have e ecosystem design feeding into eco-village design, which then feeds into eco-districts and eco-regions, entire bioregions and watersheds, which begin to resemble much more the indigenous people's landscapes. So if you look at how people lived on these landscapes, uh, which we now inhabit 5,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, even going back before the last ice age, going back tens of thousands of years ago, how did people inhabit in ways that they provided their needs, uh, their foods, their medicines, and so forth. And we get clues from archaeology and from studies of, of these systems. We can see that actually there was a balance that was kept and maintained, and that's why we were able as humans to exist for 200,000 years before the present era when we had this sudden burst of knowledge of metallurgy and fossil fuels and uh, technology that came from that. Buckminster Fuller used to say that uh, we have, we've, we've become accustomed to energy slaves. So the number of bicyclists that would equal one liter of petroleum is probably about 400 bicyclists uh, going constantly. You can imagine what it would take, how many horses would it take to carry your car over a hill? And yet you do that on less than a cup of petroleum. Uh, and so we've become accustomed to all of us. We have more slaves than the pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, and this is an addiction for us because we are so accustomed to it, we can't imagine living without it. But our children will live without it. And so now we have to think about how will they live? They can still live comfortably. They don't have to live like the pharaoh's slaves. They can live like the pharaoh. But they have to do it elegantly using the gifts that nature already provides. And what can people as individuals and as families do to reach a stable atmosphere? What is the crucial steps that we need to take in our daily lives now? It's, it's humorous to see some of the prescriptions because I can go back to Al Gore's movie, The Inconvenient Truth, and he's talking about you know, light bulbs, changing your light bulbs. Uh, and you can go to uh, Scientific American or some other magazine uh, and it will talk about uh, how you can, everybody should have electric cars. You know, as much as I like Elon Musk and the Tesla, I have to say that's a car that runs on coal. Uh, it's, it's getting its electricity from some distant power plant that's running on coal. Uh, Henry Ford and, and Thomas Edison never, never were able to develop a car that ran on coal, but Elon Musk succeeded in that. I think that the uh, important thing we need to think about is uh, actually getting closer to nature ourselves. If my children were younger, I would take them camping regularly, like at least maybe once a week, and so that they're comfortable in the outdoors. Uh, they should know how to uh, gather firewood and start a fire. They should know how to gather wild food from the, from the forest. They should know the difference between good mushrooms and bad mushrooms. Uh, so those are skills that we're going to relearn. We're going to have to relearn those. It's, it's interesting to notice that there are, were civilizations that never developed irrigation in the plow. We had, uh, we had you know, this history of northern China, northern Africa, and the Mesopotamian Valley, where the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians developed irrigation in the plow, and now today all that's there is deserts. There's, you know, they've, they've ruined the soil with irrigation in the plow. But there were places in South America, for instance, the Maya, uh, who never used irrigation or the plow. They lived on tree crops, mostly. They did have cattle, they did have uh, domestic animals, but mostly they were interested in uh, having a supply of food that came, certain things grew at certain times of the year, and you would always have enough of each thing that the entire village would always have enough. There was never a, a want. There were backup, there were resilience. So if, if there was a bad year for, for one thing, it was a good year for something else. We're going to relearn that. Uh, because trees are so much more efficient at taking carbon out of the atmosphere than grasslands. 
uh, that we're going to be learning how to grow our food on, on trees. Uh, wetlands are even more efficient than trees. So the coastal wetlands and the wetlands by rivers are enormously productive. The Aztec Trimple Empire grew the economy of the area which is today Mexico City on chinampas, which are managed swamps, artificial swamps. They took the waste from the city and they made islands in the uh, lake and they made swamps around the islands and they captured fish in the swamps and they, they captured shrimp and crabs. And then they also grew trees and food crops on the island. Uh, and they would take the human newer from the cities and bring it out to the islands and enrich the gardens on the islands. From that, they could have cities of 200, 500,000 people uh, without automobiles or anything like that, uh, without modern energy systems. They could have that many people living together and they could build pyramids. They had so much extra time. They could build pyramids. So we're, we're going to have to relearn that. We're going to have to learn how to get our food from, from water systems, from wetland systems, because that's how you trap carbon. That's how you move it into the soil. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to do it from trees, because that's how you take carbon out of the atmosphere. They're atmospheric scrub brushes. Um, if we put the guidelines of more fair and more free and more sustainable and more fun in as goals or as the context of Estonia, then what do you notice? Do we carry those values? Yes, those values are very important. We spoke earlier of barriers, of the technology not being the barrier, but society being the barrier, the cultural inertia. Uh, that we, br we bring. And the only way that you can change that is with having standards of fun. To be able to have your revolution as a singing revolution. To be able to have the a spirit that wells up in your heart and causes tears to come to your eyes. That's how we change. Uh, it's a strength of human character that makes us change and change in a way that stays changed rather than just some temporary revolution that uh, changes leaders every few years. We need to actually build worldwide the same ethos that they have in Estonia and have the same strength of heart that they have in Estonia. And it comes from understanding that actually you can party together, you can have festivals, you can have singing, you can have dance, you can have costumes, and you can enjoy the changes that have to happen as an entire society. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a good way to go. Then again, there's a very strong tendency of deforestation in Estonia, which is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's very intensely used in the industry to make paper and simple wood products and bulk, for example. And what would you do instead? Estonia suffers the same problem as Finland in this regard. Uh, they're seen as sort of a, uh, a reserve of biomass for energy. Uh, and because there's going to be pressure with the phase out of fossil fuels and uh, the, the disasters around nuclear, they're going to have to, uh, we are going to have to go to biomass as an energy system, but we need to do it in ways that do not um, destroy ecology, that actually build ecologies, cultivated ecologies. One of the things that was discovered in forestry in the 1930s and 1940s with different foresters doing experiments in different parts of the world was that mixed age, mixed species forests produce more wood than single species plantations of, of same age. Say that again, mixed age, mixed species produce more. Mixed age, mixed species forests produce more animals. They produce more butterflies. They produce more birds. Um, they produce, uh, they, they have greater net photosynthetic productivity. They send more carbon to the roots and into the soils and they enrich the soils more quickly than plantations of GMO eucalyptus. No matter how fast science thinks it can grow a tree, forests are better at it. So we need to move to that system we need to understand organic is better than industrial, than chemical. And we need to ha not have chemical and GMO forests. We need to have uh, natural forests and all of the services they provide. And then we need to take that wood when we coppice it or harvest it or take it out and take it out delicately 
uh, we take out maybe the low grades, the, the poor, the trees that are not doing well first. We don't harvest just clear cut, we harvest selectively. And then we take out, uh, take that wood and maybe we put it through a few stages. Maybe we crush the leaves for leaf protein or we cultivate mycelium, uh, make uh, f forest mushrooms in the woods. Uh, maybe we use the spent substrates from the forest mushrooms that we've grown. We feed people with all eight essential amino acids in gourmet mushrooms. Uh, and then we take the spent chips that were used to make the mushroom and then put that into the pellets that go in to make energy. But don't just make energy. Gasify that wood. Do it very efficiently. And then take what's left, which is the hard carbon of the biochar, and put that to some good use. Put that, say, to um, making animal feed supplements. So when you feed a little bit of that charcoal to animals, to cows or pigs or chickens, first off, their, their enclosures smell much sweeter. Secondly, they, uh, they put on weight faster. They have less health issues. They don't need antibiotics. Um, they're much less expensive for farmers to care for, and they produce much more profits for farmers. And then their manure is much richer in carbon. And so when the manure goes back to the field, the field grows better, and it renews itself better. And, and if you put it in the forest, it makes trees faster. So for these reasons, you, you look at you know small technological tree, tweaks Pyrolysis instead of burning, it's obvious. Uh, rocket stoves for cooking. Uh, the, the simple solutions are actually uh, very uh, important and very fast and very easy and they save you money immediately or they actually make you money. So why would we not do them? You know, it's just obvious. Thank you for answering. Sure, yeah, my pleasure.